Hello and welcome back to Unheard. It has been quite a week since we launched our expose of the Global Disinformation Index, the mysterious entity that it turned out was trying to shut down our business model on very tenuous grounds, calling Unheard anti-trans just because we publish gender-critical feminists like Professor Kathleen Stock and somehow managing to call that disinformation. In any case, the video that I made has been viewed nearly 8 million times on X, that is Twitter, and was partially propelled by being shared by none other than Elon Musk himself with the following message. Ironically, he said, GDI pushes disinformation and should be shut down with recriminations for the miscreants. I am headed to the US next week for the Dissident Dialogues Festival. If you are there, definitely check it out, 3rd and 4th of May in New York. And I'm hoping that we might get a conversation with Elon Musk during that week, so stay tuned for that. Elon wasn't the only industry titan to weigh in, however. The CEO of Zoho, a huge Indian-based software company and one of the richest people in the world, said the following... It is not just that the Global Disinformation Index turns out to be a global left censor board, he said. Most of the global indexes that purport to rank countries on a variety of criteria have an explicit or nearly explicit left agenda. We must be careful in using these rankings. That was then picked up and covered by a number of Indian outlets. Personally, I was then contacted by more than a dozen parliamentarians, MPs and members of the House of Lords, some of them cabinet-level ministers, who wanted to make clear that they are outraged and determined to see the GDI defunded and make sure that it doesn't receive a single penny of taxpayer money. The Times, that is the Times of London, not the New York Times, covered the story three times, initially with my column explaining what had happened, Then secondly, another news story, and then finally on Saturday, right there in the middle of page two of the newspaper, the following story, MPs raise concerns over fake news fund. It included a couple of new tidbits that hadn't been reported. First of all, a government source said that any moves to stifle debate about the hotly contested topic of transgender rights was worrying. Quote, As the CAST review has shown, shutting down gender-critical beliefs can have terrible consequences in the real world, the source said. That's how newspaper reporting works. The source is someone close to a senior cabinet minister. We are not exactly sure who, but that's the way reporting works in the mainstream media. New quote. In the wake of CAS, we need to do more to ensure public money is not spent on dubious bodies looking to silence those prepared to tell the truth. Quite strong words and quite encouraging from someone at the heart of the government. It also featured another quote from Baroness Stoll. This is the highly influential member of the House of Lords who was formerly head of the Charity Commission who chairs the inquiry into the future of news and who had invited me to appear. She said, Tackling disinformation is important, but it must not lead to censorship of legitimate opinions and public debate. We will certainly be following up with ministers about the evidence we've received as part of our ongoing inquiry into the future of news. Intriguing. I then went on Times Radio to talk to former BBC journalist Asmar Mir and Stieg Abel. Could efforts to stop lies spreading around the internet actually be making things worse? The bigger question which I was talking about in the inquiry is just to be much more cautious about the sort of secondary effects of things like uh, combating disinformation because mm. it sounds like it's a it's a responsible thing to do but i think if you look at the history since really since 2016 when the disinformation panic first started and then of course it accelerated through covid the attempts by government uh, often in collusion with big tech to control the narrative to say okay we are going to take the messy beast of the internet and tame it and insist that everyone only thinks one thing All of them have backfired because quasi-official bodies get things wrong as well. Our story went international. It was covered in the German press, in the Frankfurter Allgemeine. And they had a very strong column on the topic. And they put it like this. Anyone who puts Kathleen Stock alongside Putin's trolls and right-wing extremist radical liars doesn't want to check facts. 
but instead wants to mute attitudes that they don't like. The GDI becomes a political problem because its supporters also include the European Union and the German Foreign Office, which is not particularly helpful at this time when so many Germans want to believe that a left-green elite are restricting freedom of expression. The Irish Times also weighed in with another strong column from Hugh Linehan. He had this to say, focusing on the shift from targeting factually inaccurate content towards this mysterious thing called an adversarial narrative that I highlighted in our investigation. Quote, This seems quite a shift. It provides ammunition to those critics of the entire anti-disinformation project, mostly from the right, who argue that it is merely a thinly veiled attempt to censor views that the progressive left consider dangerous or distasteful. But it should be just as concerning to anyone who believes that society really does need better guardrails against the tidal wave of online disinformation. Interesting there that people who support the disinformation movement, even they were quite shocked about what we had to say. And I think that's a good thing, by the way, because it means that the establishment center is also realizing that this overreach is dangerous. If Sayer's account is accurate, and it has yet to be rebutted, he said, it would appear that an organization financed by several governments is using opaque strategies to stifle legitimate debate in a democracy. It's the sort of conspiracy theory you might come across on a dodgy website, except this time it might be true. Zach Goldsmith, Lord Goldsmith, a prominent member of the British Conservatives, said this, This organization, the Global Disinformation Index, shouldn't receive a penny of public money until it can demonstrate beyond doubt that it has not itself become a purveyor of disinformation. It is beyond belief that it considers basic biology to be disinformation. We also noticed some somewhat mysterious activity over at Wikipedia, where the official entry for the Global Disinformation Index has been taken out of being fully published and returned to draft mode. And it looks very slight. It suddenly got very small. It doesn't have a lot of information and makes almost no reference to our investigation or the huge amount of public scrutiny that they suddenly are facing. And right there at the end, there's a list of footnotes. It includes the Irish Times article about our investigation. It includes the Frankfurter Allgemeine article about our investigation but, surprise, surprise, does not include the original unheard link. I suppose it is not beyond the realms of imagination that people within the GDI or close friends of the GDI have been hard at work at Wikipedia editing away to make sure their reputation is not damaged. Let's keep a close eye on that Wikipedia entry. So who have we not heard from? Well, mainly the Global Disinformation Index. You might have thought after global figures are weighing in, people in Parliament, major newspapers are all talking about how their activity is suspect and they shouldn't be receiving public money, they might make a statement. You might expect that one of their spokespeople would come out and defend them. Maybe they'd say we made a mistake with unheard. Maybe they would say something else. But no, completely absent, mysteriously invisible. It's the most extraordinary PR response you could imagine. And I think tells you quite a lot about what that organization has become. Because if you go back to their website back in 2018, when they first launched, as I did in our investigation, you can see that transparency is one of their key values. They talk about how when they publish their index, they're gonna make sure it's public. It's not. They're gonna make sure that the mechanisms and the rationale for the decisions they reach are publicly shareable. They're not and they're gonna be there to defend their decisions. Well, evidently, after an enormous global news story about them, and they don't even say a peep, they're not. So it's quite disappointing, to say the least, just how untransparent an organization devoted to combating disinformation seems to be. Given this huge amount of public interest in what we had to say, I thought we should put my testimony to the House of Lords out there on YouTube for everyone to look at. It's kind of hard to find on the Parliament website. I was there for an inquiry the House of Lords is doing into the future of news. You turn up, you go through all of the very elaborate Victorian Gothic chambers, then you come to a committee room and there there's around 12 or 14 lords, uh, most of whom are people who've done big things in public life. They've had 
grand positions. Some of them are formerly MPs. And they're now on this committee investigating digital and the future of media. On the committee are people like Dido Harding, now a Baroness. You might remember her from the COVID era. She headed up the NHS test and trace system, which you might have strong views about, but she was actually very interested in what we had to say. And I thought she might be a bit resistant on some of what I was saying to do with the COVID era, but she seemed interested. Lord Hall, former director general of the BBC, pretty much want the top job in British media. Uh, he was also interested in what we were talking about. And because of the arcane systems of the House of Lords, we even had a bishop. Yes, Lord Bishop of Leeds was present. Again, very interested. So they started by asking how we felt the conversation around disinformation had changed over the past 10 years. The question was whether it's changed in the past 10 years. Uh, I think really the past eight years is the most relevant time frame. Uh, it seems to me it's inextricably linked to the populist revolutions of 2016, both Brexit and Trump, and everything that's happened since, particularly the COVID era. And actually, you can chart this if you look at Google Trends, which is quite a useful tool to see how much people are searching. Nobody was really searching for disinformation. It wasn't a talked about topic prior to 2016. It quadrupled during 2016, and it has increased more than 30 times since the middle part of 2016 and, and 2022. So it's a new, relatively new talking point. Um, and what I observe, I've been in charge of Unheard for the past five years, and you know, I, I really see our role as a publication as sort of facing both ways on both towards the establishment uh, and having very, very high standards, meticulous fact-checking and making sure it's high quality, but also understanding the sort of anti-establishment world and YouTube and the open internet. And what I've really observed, particularly during the COVID era, is that the disinformation movement, if we can call it that, attempts to counter disinformation have themselves been very damaging and have, I would say, exacerbated losses in public trust, fast forwarded the collapse in trust in the media and in government. Uh, and I don't think it's talked about nearly enough what the, the backfiring negative effects are of every new initiative to counter disinformation. There's been talk um, today in the earlier session about um, international actors, state actors, and I think we should think about that in a separate category, uh, because I think we'd all agree that if during a war or if there is a foreign country that is actually attacking us, I think we would agree that that needs to be responded to very vigorously. But this new concept that somehow it's the government's role to point out so-called disinformation from their own people uh, and that it, that term should be used in a political context between political opponents is, is a new idea. And I'm really worried that it itself, the, the, the attempt to fix it is actually more dangerous than the... Could you give problem. any examples? And uh, I'm interested in whether <clears throat> anti-vax during COVID was a, is an example of that. Yeah, I, I do think the, the fusion of kind of government messaging with the mainstream media during COVID was, and the, how strictly that was policed. Um, you know, it was important for us at Unheard because we were actually conducting interviews with experts that had all sorts of different views about things like lockdowns and vaccine mandates and the rest of it. And, you know, it took off. There was a huge underserved audience for responsible questioning of those issues. And you weren't finding it in the mainstream media and I, I am certain having witnessed that up close that many many thousands of people who prior to the COVID experience were not especially politicized and didn't really think about these things have been radicalized during that process because there was this sense of a sort of single message coming out of all of the television screens and it felt very dystopian and unnerving to people it didn't feel like a free media so I, I do think big mistakes were made during COVID, and, and actually I was pleased to see the House of Commons Culture Committee just a couple of days ago request a report into the activity of the so-called um, government disinformation unit in relation to COVID, because yes, I think creation of those entities and the proliferation of them actually just fan the flames of the conspiratorial worldview, because 
it, it gives legitimacy to the idea that there are far away uh, government-backed censors watching your every move and policing normal political discourse. So my point of view is definitely that we should be, while recognising that the <coughs> internet is open and disinformation or inaccurate ideas can travel, and we should be observing that, we should be very careful about measures to start censorship, particularly if they involve the government, because I think they do more harm than good. Dido Harding then asked, and if you remember, I had mentioned she actually played a really important role in the government COVID response. She headed up this huge test and trace program, was involved in the vaccine program, and therefore I had thought she might be a little bit resistant to some of my ideas, but actually even she was quite interested and engaged. I chose that as the opportunity to talk about the GDI and everything they have been up to. I would love to provide one specific example, if I could, of just how embedded the, the danger of politicising this movement has become. Um, we at Unheard decided to take ads last year for the first time. We have a subscription business and we didn't have ads, but we decided to take them. And we went to three successive ad agencies, each of which were really excited about our product. We have a large audience in the UK and the US, very influential people, etc. The numbers they were expecting us to get were very significant. And each time, in three successive times, we only got a tiny, tiny fraction of what was expected. And this was a real mystery. The ad agencies themselves were confused by it. And eventually, with the third agency, we uncovered that in the machinery of delivering online ads, there are, exist these gatekeepers, uh, which call themselves ratings agencies, uh, that give ratings to websites based on disinformation or not, based on you know, security and risk. And that one of those agencies, called the Global Disinformation Index, had given our website a dangerous rating. I should say another one of them, NewsGuard, gives us 92.5%, which is more than the New York Times, which shows how subjective this is. But these kinds of bodies, and the Global Disinformation <coughs> Index, by the way, is supported by money from this government, um, as well as the European Union, and as well as the US government via the State Department, have become kind of detached and unaccountable actors that can literally turn off the business model of news websites by turning off their ad supply. In your earlier question, you acknowledge that there are, as we heard from Professor Martin, nation states acting in this space. How do you have focus on the very real nation state mm. issues while at the same time protecting free speech? Um, in a way, no, as highlighted by the example that you've just given. How do you square that circle? I mean, very, I know we have not very much time, so it's a short answer. Acting against your own people, um, whether it's ob observing them, defunding them, censoring them, fiddling with their business models, is, I think, just something that should really be avoided in almost all scenarios. So, you know... Governments can make a very clear distinction, I would have thought. Yes, if it concerns foreign actors, let's get involved. But we should be extremely careful about anything where, when it regards our own citizens because what it will do is magnify paranoia and distrust. Next, they asked, what should government and big tech do about disinformation? Should they just do absolutely nothing? Here's what I had to say. I think it should be almost entirely the responsibility of media organisations. It used to be considered an intrinsic part of journalism to do fact-checking, and it should still be. Fact-checking, I don't know why it's now considered a separate skill set. Every journalist should be a good fact-checker. And it's absolutely the responsibility of a publication to check the quality of the information it's putting out. And if it puts out shoddy information, it's, it will become less trusted by its audience. Um, you know, we, we, we must credit people with the ability to be more sophisticated, I think, and already people are becoming so. Um, in terms of what we should do, I definitely think less is more um, in terms of creating new units. And this goes for big corporations as well as governments, that every time you create a, an entity with an, an Orwellian-sounding name, you, you create a new risk that everyone is going to suspect you of censorship. So first, 
first of all, ask, do we really need to do this? Um, secondly, can it be done in a more organic way? And I think um, community notes was mentioned in the previous hour, and I think that is an interesting example. It's, it's a system within the new Musk-controlled Twitter. Um, it's by no means perfect, and I'm sure it frustrates a lot of people, because when you put out a tweet, if enough people think it's inaccurate, you get a sort of note under it saying this has been questioned. Um, but I think that's a more realistic and honest way to talk about disputes about facts, because when you see one of those, you think, okay, this is the claim, and I understand that it's contentious. I don't know if it's definitely wrong, and crucially, it avoids the taint of officialdom. There's no sense that it's, it comes from the centre and somehow... And in fact, Elon Musk himself is subject to fact-checking on his own platform, which is good to see. So the more organic and kind of bottom-up that process can be, I think the more trust uh, it will have. And thirdly, trying to make sure if any kind of measures need to um, be instituted to do with censoring things or taking things down, make sure there is a transparent process attached to it. Because I think a lot of the alienation and paranoia has come from this sense that there is never an explanation given. Things are mysteriously removed and you have no recourse. So it goes against your sort of liberal instinct that if you be, are judged to have committed disinformation, you want to be able to appeal it. But it's very rarely possible. It, it, these things happen very removed. So if you're going to act as a sort of court on people's uh, pronouncements, you need to offer a process that is clear and people can appeal. So there'd be my suggestions for how better to treat the disinformation problem. We then got into a conversation about the dangers of the online world, about how the media is becoming hard to navigate and how fundamental questions of truth are becoming secondary to just getting clicks and whatever you say, it doesn't matter if it's true or not, as long as people are interested, it works. And these questions came from the Lord Bishop. An old friend I haven't seen for a long time who works in one of our major media organisations here, um, who told me it's good to work for an organisation that does good in the world, an organisation that, um, contrary to the protestation by journalists that journalists are all interested in the truth, tells lies. And they lie repeatedly. Um, and... I hear what you're saying, Freddie, about um, you know journalists should check their own facts, but they're in a different environment now, where the prioritising of you know clicks over truth seems to have won out. Mm. Um, how do you deal with that? In uh, I mean, you could do it in your particular organisation, but what about across the board? I definitely would not deny that it is a very rapidly changing and fraught time. Uh, you know, the media business models, frankly, aren't working, many of them. Um, and we know, as all our colleagues in the industry know, that you have to get attention in order to ultimately convert people to subscribers or whatever your model is. So, you know, what, what people call chasing clicks is ultimately has to be part of the recipe. Um, I, I guess I would say two things. First of all, I, I don't think it's for the government to come in and try to fix it, basically, because if, if you start to try and centralise the narrative, um, you're going to create a whole load of secondary problems. Um, and second of all, I take a more optimistic view long term, that yes, at the moment people are sucked into echo chambers and they're, here, they're having their opinions reinforced and so on. But as Professor Dutton said, people actually do um, increasingly look to multiple sources. The very young people I speak to are quite sophisticated about the information they've received. They're very sceptical, already anticipating questions of AI and so on. Um, so I think long term, there must be a value to truth. And you're going to have an advantage over your friends and colleagues if you have accurate information. So I, I feel like long term, there will be a demand for that and that the, the business model will surface. But that's not to say it's not going to be a turbulent time in the meantime. So it's about preventing scepticism, which is good, becoming cynicism, mm. destructive. Finally, here's Baroness Stoll, the chair of the committee, asking what government should do to combat the disinformation movement. Is there something specific that you feel 
could actually make a difference if the government were to, to intervene in some way? Well, the government could stop funding these kind of organisations. Yeah. That's an easy, easy win. And is that, um, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, earlier on as well, you talked about a disinformation movement. Mm. Is that, I mean, you know, clearly that organisation would qualify, I think, for, for, for that category. I mean, how, how well known are the different sort of organisations that are involved in this sort of Very thing? Very ob obscure. Mm. Very few people know about them, but it has really blossomed over this period. So I think, yeah, I, I would like to see those organisations held to a much higher standard. And, you know, insofar as any of them need to exist, um, to really put an emphasis on bipartisanship, really make sure they're not sort of pushing a particular ideology, which happens all too frequently, um, and generally be sceptical of, of the attempt by what I would call the disinformation movement to draw government in, because the effect of it, we saw, for example, with uh, Twitter during the COVID era that was recently exposed when Elon Musk bought it, once you have a cosy direct channel between government and big tech, big media sites, under the guise of safety, disinformation, things that sound very responsible, appropriate government activities, it very quickly escalates into actually will you please arrange a, a more helpful message for us. Uh, and that I think is, is very, very damaging. So the principle of separation from the media um, separation from these big tech companies should we should try to re-establish. Okay, and is there? Um, I mean, you know, we know about the, the the Twitter files, as you say, because you know there was that exposure in the U.S. We, uh, you know, the, there are other examples in the U.S. That, which I think has exposed some kind of, uh, you know, in in involvement of agencies in in ways that. Um, perhaps were not known about before. Is there any example like that in the UK that mm. you've come across? Well, the example I began with, I think, is the clearest, which was the COVID era. And I think we, we should all look back at that era with sobriety, because in the, in the atmosphere of fear that was completely understandable, government messaging and media narratives merged to a very close degree, um, not only amongst the BBC, but among the, I would say, the mainstream media generally. They were, we saw WhatsApp messages from Hancock and um, people inside the government just saying, yes, we want this on the front page tomorrow, all under the guise of safety. You know, we need to communicate this safety message. But it ended up being that the government was just dictating to the media, which I think was really damaging. Um, so that, to me, is the most salient example. So that was me at the House of Lords last week. Obviously, it's just one committee. It's not even the government. And we are very far from where we need to get in terms of changing some of this really quite sinister infrastructure that has built up under the heading of disinformation. And yet, it feels in the last week that we've made some small amount of progress. At the very least, more people are aware that the disinformation movement is potentially more sinister than it sounds. In the meantime, we want your help. If you spot things related to this, whether it's the Global Disinformation Index or any other similar body in any country across Europe, North America, or around the world, let us know. We want to be on top of this issue and we want to begin to take the fight to some of these organizations. So we've created a special email address, disinfo at unheard.com. And if you have spotted concrete facts, we're not looking, I'm afraid to say, for your opinion about how awful it is or whether you disagree with me or those kinds of things. What we want are concrete facts that have not been adequately covered in the media and which might help shine a light on how this whole elaborate and complicated system works. And as ever, don't forget to subscribe to Unheard to make sure to stay up to the date with the very latest on this and other key issues unheard.com slash join.